probably the most complicated question in copyright law. What is substantial similarity? And how can you advise a client? Because I can't, even if I'm a really, really well-educated lawyer, I can't just go to a client and say, yes or no, this is substantially similar. We more or less have to give a client an idea that it likely isn't substantially similar to a jury, or it likely is substantially similar to a jury, or maybe it's on the line and we don't know how a jury would go. The thing that I'm most thankful for in this whole Katy Perry, Dark Horse, Flame, Joyful Noise thing uh, is, thank goodness they're both listenable. Like you can, they're, they're, they're palatable songs. You can actually listen to them and be like, okay, yeah, this isn't so horrible that I'm, that I'm now regretting becoming a copyright attorney. This is a community-supported legal education channel. Find out how you can support our mission at the links in the description below. So we're going to talk about the joyful noise versus dark horse ruling. And I was trying to think of what could I really bring to this. It's a jury verdict. So that means the jury doesn't hand down a reasoned opinion. Uh, the jury sure will issue findings and maybe we can get a copy of the findings and see if there's something in particular. But I, I don't think we actually need the jury's findings in order to answer the question. Of, of whether this was substantial similarity or not. I think if we simply look at the legal definitions surrounding substantial similarity, I think we will all quickly realize that the jury either came to the right conclusion or even if you still disagree, you may agree that the jury had the right or the discretion to come to the conclusion that they were copyright infringement, that the Dark Horse piece was through the mechanisms you'll see of substantial similarity was not necessarily the whole piece, but because enough of it was substantially similar, it tainted the whole piece. And so the doesn't really matter whether it's a small piece or a large piece, it's tainted with copyright infringement. So we'll see how that works. I'm not saying that you'll agree that it's substantially similar or that you'll agree that it's copyright infringement or that you'll agree that there should have been a finding of a two and a half million dollar judgment. Um, but I will tell you that I think you'll understand what substantial similarity is, at least for this particular case. You'll also understand why even lawyers like myself don't entirely know whether two similar works are substantially similar and therefore copyright infringement right off the bat or just by listening to them. Sure, there are cases that are very clear, but then there are cases like this where it's really on the border. And you've seen some commentators like Adam Neely complain that now Flame and Joyful Noise own the, the minor scale. And that's, not, that's certainly not what's happening here. I think they just simply misunderstand what copyright substantial similarity is. And who wouldn't misunderstand it? It's a seriously complicated doctrine. But once you get through it, it makes a lot of, lot of sense. A lot of sense once you see how it's done. How in the world can this be copyright infringement? Everyone is confused. At least as far as I've seen, Adam Neely is confused and a bunch of other musicians are very, very confused as to how a jury could have found these two songs are substantially similar. Well, we've spent all weekend listening to them over and over and over again, and it did not take, it, it didn't take over and over and over again to convince me that the portion of the song that's in question is substantially similar and well within the discretion of a jury to find. So that's our story. Have a nice day. Thank you very much. No, of course not. What we do here at Lawful Masses is try to try to add value to the thing by explaining what the heck's going on. Now what we don't have, as far as I know, is we don't have a opinion or a decision or some long prose, a legal proof as to what the jury exactly saw that was considered substantially similar. But this is not really that much of a borderline case where I have to guess what the jury was, what was thinking. Yes, in many cases, a jury can come back with a wild verdict or something, unsupported by law or fact, 
Um, a jury might find someone who's clearly guilty not guilty. We see a lot of that when police officers are charged with crimes for one reason or another. I'm not getting into the politics or reasons for it, but for one reason or another, a lot of times in the U.S., police officers that are charged with crimes are acquitted of those crimes, even when much of the public or, or much of the, the victim's peers are are very, very certain that a crime had been committed and, and that an officer needed to be punished. So it's not that juries can't be swayed and things couldn't come out wrong. And it's possible that someone may appeal and, and Katy Perry may appeal and, and there might be something that's overturnable here, but I don't, I don't really see it yet. The jury really is the party or the body that is entrusted with the discretion to make the determination of substantial similarity. But it doesn't do it in a vacuum. The jury doesn't just get to hear both songs and then check yes or no, this is substantially similar. There's a lot of evidence and testimony and everything before that, and so we'll go over that. First, though, I thought we should go over a little bit about the standard of substantial similarity. And so I looked up and did a little bit of, of research on the issues that occur in substantial similarity. I've highlighted a few things here that I wanted to bring to you. Uh, so here is a passage. Now this is a copyrighted passage, so I am relying on fair use, and I'm hoping that I'm showing you only just the part that I need and not committing copyright infringement by showing you anymore. So this is, and the reason why I'm being careful is this is an organization that could very well uh, pursue a copyright infringement claim if they thought that I had done something wrong. This is Matthew Bender's Nimmer on Copyright, and they're talking about substantial similarity here. No easy rule of thumb can be stated as to the quantum of fragmented literal similarity permitted without crossing the line of substantial similarity. The question in each case is whether the similarity relates to matter that constitutes a substantial portion of plaintiff's work, not whether such material constitutes a substantial portion of defendant's work. Thus, for example, the fact that the sampled material is played throughout defendant's song cannot establish liability if that snippet constitutes an insubstantial portion of plaintiff's composition. So one of the first questions you should be asking yourself about Katy Perry and Dark Horse versus Joyful Noise is, was Katy Perry's composition Dark Horse, did it make use of any part of plaintiff's work that could be considered a substantial portion. And when you go and listen to Joyful Noise, not only does it start with the descending minor uh, uh, ostinato, um, it also uses the descending minor ostinato as a support hook throughout the song. So it does not matter whether Katy Perry used the descending minor ostinato as a hook in her song, what matters is whether what she used was a hook or substantial or rather not insubstantial portion of plaintiff's work of, of joyful noises composition. Even if the similar material is quantitatively small, if it is qualitatively important, the trier of fact may properly find substantial similarity. Of course, the trier of fact is the jury. So then that puts it squarely within the discretion of the jury to decide whether or not it is substantially similar. Thus, in one off-cited case, the court held infringing. Defendants broadcast of one 12-second segment and one two-and-a-half-minute segment from plaintiff's film. That's a case where ABC News or ABC Broadcasting used a... The, those segments of Champion, a movie about a, a retired football player. It doesn't really tell us anything here because it wasn't like there was a portion copied of a movie or something like that. This was a music composition, parts repeat. So it, you can't really measure it by, you know, did you, did you copy this two-second portion that goes doot, 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 doot. It doesn't really work that way. In, a, in general, under such circumstances, the defendant may not claim immunity on the grounds that the infringement is such a little one. So a small amount of copying does not change the question of whether the compositions or some not insubstantial portion is substantially similar. So then looking up the cases that are cited there and looking up some research on substantial similarity, because this is, like I said before, 
or maybe I didn't. This is one of the most complicated questions in law and probably the most complicated question in copyright law. What is substantial similarity and how can you advise a client? Because I can't, even if I'm a really, really well-educated lawyer, I can't just go to a client and say, yes or no, this is substantially similar. We more or less have to give a client an idea that it likely isn't substantially similar to a jury, or it likely is substantially similar to a jury, or maybe it's on the line and we don't know how a jury would go. So we want our client to be on the not substantially similar side or the not infringing side of that line. Does that, does that gray the line enough for you? Does you understand what's going on there? We, we can't say because I'm not the jury. We can guess what a jury might say. Well, let's clarify what standard the jury is using because what, what, what do you tell the jury? Okay, great. Uh, jury, you, you're the ones who have to find out if this is substantially similar or not. Well, obviously, they're, they don't know any more than you or I, so why, you know, that doesn't help them very much. So what is the standard that a jury applies, and, and what do they get told or, or, or what? So here is the case of NOLA Spice Designs. NOLA would be Norlands, Louisiana. That's what NOLA is. Versus Hadel Enterprises Incorporated. And I've got, this is a, this is a major, Tactical's going to love this because she's, she's missed, and by love I mean she's not going to love it, because she's missed a wonderful trademark case. This is a, a, a trademark case, although we're not going over it for its trademark uh, uh, value. We are going over it for its Mardi Gras bead dog value. This is a Mardi Gras bead dog. If you know what Mardi Gras beads are, they look like this here and then you can twist them up into a shape if you are skilled and you know the recipe. Well, other people have then taken and made art from that. You can see here's like a JPEG print, here's a, you know, here's one that has a, a necklace, here's one from Hadel's Bakery. So that's what we're talking about in this case. Hopefully that now makes this will make a little sense now this case concerns the intersection between intellectual property rights and a mardi gras tradition during mardi gras parades in norlands parade crews throw strands of plastic beads to onlookers who in turn have created bead dogs by twisting these strands into the shape of a dog hadel enterprises owns hadel's bakery in norlands which makes and sells pastries and cakes including its popular king cake sold during the Mardi Gras season. In 2008, they commissioned an artist to design a mascot which was named the Mardi Gras Bead Dog. And the United States Patent and Trademark Office issued two trademarks to Hadel for respectively the phrase Mardi Gras Bead Dog and its bead dog design. The design consists of a stylized dog wearing a beaded necklace with the dog being formed by a series of spheres designed to look like Mardi Gras style beads. The dog has two eyes and a nose, all formed by smaller beads. Both registrations cover king cake pastries, jewelry and clothing, shirts, hats, baby jumpsuits. Hayden sells these items in its Norlands store online and through its licensee, Flirty Girl, a Norlands retailer. In September 2012, Hadel obtained a certificate of copyright registration for a work titled Bead Dog in Photographs, Jewelry Design, 2D Artwork Sculptures. Hadel has acknowledged that its mascot brings to mind the traditional bead dog made of Mardi Gras beads. Nevertheless, Hadel asserts that its mascot and its use of the phrase Mardi Gras bead dog differ from the Mardi Gras tradition in key respects, which we will discuss. In May 2012, Ra Raquel Duarte formed Nola Spice Designs, which sells jewelry and accessories, including necklaces and earrings featuring bead dog trinkets. Duarte twists each bead dog by hand from beads and wire, following the same general method that she used to make bead dogs as a child during Mardi Gras. By contrast, the bead dogs in Hadel's jewelry are made of sterling silver. Duarte sells her jewelry on the internet under titles that include the phrase bead dog, but not Mardi Gras bead dog. Hadel learned of Duarte's bead dogs through Hadel's customers. In August 2012, Hadel sent Nola Spice Designs a letter noting Hadel's trademark and copyright in the bead dog design and demanding, among other things, that Nola Spice Designs remove from its website all display, mention, or reference to the bead dog design and cease any and all promotion, sale, and or use of materials incorporating the bead dog design. 
In October 2012, Nola Spice Designs filed a complaint against Hadel, seeking one, a declaratory judgment that Nola's activities do not violate the Lanham Act or any other law, a cancellation of their trademarks and damages for unfair trade practices under the LUPTA, or the LUTPA, the Louisiana Unfair Trade Practices Act. I'm going to skip all of that and go straight to the copyright substantial similarity because you did not come here to hear about Mardi Gras bead dogs. You came here to hear about Katy Perry and why she's infringing. Now, I want to be clear about one other important thing because I've seen this a lot. I've seen lots of people accusing Katy Perry of stealing or vice versa, accusing uh, Flame of some kind of reverse theft by pursuing an illegitimate claim in copyright court. This is not stealing, and I really don't like calling it stealing. It is one thing to grab somebody's property and take it. It's one thing to trick somebody into giving you property and then keeping it. It is an entirely different thing to commit copyright infringement. Certainly, you could take something of someone's through copyright infringement, but then calling them or accusing them of stealing, maybe there are some really egregious cases where it's really clear that it's theft and stealing. But let's be clear here, Katy Perry's writers and Katy Perry and whoever else is involved that, I, that I'm not mentioning, who's involved in the writing process or whatever, even if they heard joyful noise and said, that's really cool, we want to incorporate that sound in our song, they did not know ahead of time that this jury was going to find them liable for copyright infringement. And vice versa, joyful noise, upon hearing something that sounds substantially similar to their song, has every right to go through the civil court process and have a jury find whether or not copyright infringement was committed. Of all the things we're talking about, there were two mass shootings in the U.S. in the past two days. Past day, I think it was. Let's, let's all celebrate when people use the civil process the way it was meant to be used. In no way am I saying that, that people who are, who are creating songs are going to be shooting like, like insane mass shooters. No, but I'm saying that one person has gone to the extreme of not using society's processes for adjudicating social issues or disputes or whatever. On the other hand, someone is being accused of going too far by using the preferred civil process which is ridiculous. So let's all back off. Anyone who's accusing these people of having an unnecessary fight or stealing money from each other, this is just a civil dispute over whether two songs sound similar. Nothing, nothing more. And this is the preferred way to resolve this dispute. And these parties can afford to resolve the dispute. No one is going to die. No one is being bodily injured. So let's just back off of the extremism a little bit, we're talking about a song or a pair of songs and whether they sound like each other and whether that's something that is actionable under copyright law. So returning to our discussion on the NOLA case, the question of substantial similarity typically should be left to the fact finder. And who's the fact finder? The fact finder is the jury. It could be the judge if the parties agreed but either party, either the plaintiff or defendant, can request trial by jury and get trial by jury. To assess substantial similarity, we have often cited the following test. Quote, a side-by-side -side comparison must be made between the original and the copy to determine whether a layman would view the two works as substantially similar. There's some seriously important stuff in there. We have often cited the following test, a side-by-side -side comparison between the original and the copy, determined by a layman, whether a layman would view the two works as substantially similar. Where the copyrighted work contains unprotectable elements, however, the first step is to distinguish between protectable and unprotectable elements of the copyrighted work, which I don't have this prepared for you, but I'm assuming that there was lots of testimony between Katy Perry's side and Flame's side about how the 
works were prepared and therefore what elements are protectable and unprotectable. What is a protectable copyright element? Because the court isn't going to tell you here. Well, anything that is fixed in a tangible medium of expression is automatically copyrighted and then to sue you have to complete the registration requirements so in this case they they, they definitely these are these are two professional musicians they they completed the registration requirements to get here that's fine whether or not it's copyright infringement then comes down to either direct copying or access to the work the original work followed by a, a creation of a work that is substantially similar and any element could be something that's copied. You you don't get away with 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 some kind of copyright infringement, but not if you only copy three seconds of the song or something like that. It doesn't. It isn't about the seconds. It's about the heart. It's about the the meaning. It's about the the germaneness. It's about what what is the thing, the hook, the catch, the 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 heart of the work, the core meaning of the work. And if you've taken that, that also counts. So was there a not insubstantial portion of Joyful Noise copy? Remember, that's the question. The next inquiry is whether the allegedly infringing work bears a substantial similarity to the protectable aspects of the original work. To support a claim of copyright infringement, the copy must bear a substantial similarity to the protected elements of the original. This determination should be based on the perspective of a layman or ordinary observer. Once again, this substantial similarity determination should be based on the perspective of a layman or ordinary observer, not a musicologist not a professional musician, not some very well-educated expert witness. The expert witness has a purpose. The expert witnesses are there to explain the party's positions in the best language possible, in the most persuasive language possible. That's not wrong. What's wrong is anticipating or expecting that substantial similarity rests on that expert's determination, not on a layman's determination. It is from the perspective of a layman or ordinary observer. A layman must detect piracy without any aid or suggestion or critical analysis by others. Our precedents also support consideration of the importance of the copied protectable elements to the copyrighted work as a whole. Applying these principles to Hadel's claim, remember we're here on the, on the Mardi Gras bead dog on, in this particular case that we're reading. Applying these principles to Hadel's claim, we must first identify the unprotectable elements in the bead dog design, which is manifested most clearly in sculpture form. Hadel concedes that its bead dog design is a derivative work, meaning that it is based upon one or more pre-existing works. The copyright in a derivative work extends only to the material contributed by the author of such work as distinguished from the pre-existing material employed in the work and does not imply any exclusive right in the pre-existing material. So what does that mean for the Katy Perry thing? They would have been argument and testimony over whether that descending, that minor descending ostinato was something that had been done often before or, or even at least just done before in some, in some way that the parties would have both had access to or something. And, and in, in doing so in, in having that having already existed, that this is that, that the Katy Perry or Joyful Noise works were either derivative works and somehow unprotectable because they, they didn't make some new transformative use but rather they, they, they employed this pre-existing material in such a way that didn't create a new copyright on that particular phrase. So the question really there became, was this descending minor ostinato something that had been done before and was unprotectable? And I, I, I imagine no, or that would have been the thing that, that undid the case. Adel concedes that the body of its bead dog design is unprotectable as pre-existing material because it mimics the body of a traditional bead dog. Hadel nevertheless contends that its original contributions include, among other things, the selection and arrangement of the necklace, nose, eyes, and tail, all made of smaller beads. However, anatomical figures on replicas of animals are not entitled to copyright protection. 
common anatomical features such as arms, legs, faces, and fingers on cartoon figures are not protectable elements. An upturned nose, bow lips, and wide eyes are the idea of a certain type of doll face. That idea belongs not to Mattel, but to the public domain, in the Mattel case. As for the necklace in Hadel's design, the ring of spheres around the neck of Hadel's bead dog may be characterized as a collar. Collars on dogs, like anatomical features, are common ideas that belong to the public domain. Still, while the idea of eyes, a nose, and a tail, and a collar are not protectable, the manner in which Hadel expresses those features may be protectable, as long as the expression is original and not dictated by the underlying idea. We now compare Nola Spice's bead dog to the protectable elements of Hadel's bead dog, assuming the perspective of an ordinary observer and considering the significance of the protectable elements to Hadel's work as a whole. So that's important because you're about to see how the court applies the ordinary observer standard to a substantial similarity test. Focusing on the protectable elements of Hadel's design, the similarity between Nola Spices and Hadel's bead dogs is the expression of the collar as a ring of small spheres. As for the differences, the torso of Hadel's bead dog has three spheres, while the torso of Nola Spices' bead dog has one sphere. The spheres that make up Hadel's bead dog are pressed together, whereas visible wire connects the spheres that make up Nola, Spice, Nola Spices' bead dogs. Whereas the tail of Hadel's bead dog consists of two spheres and no wire, the tails of Nola Spice's bead dogs include a curled wire either alone or atop one or two spheres. Likewise, the noses of the Nola Spice's bead dog include a curled wire either alone or atop a single sphere, while the nose of Hadel's bead dog is a single sphere. Unlike Hadel's bead dog, Nola Spice's bead dogs do not have eyes. No reasonable juror could conclude that the Nola Spice's bead dogs bear a substantial similarity to the way in which the eyes, nose, and tail are expressed. Indeed, Hadel focuses its argument on the collar, conceding that its copyright infringement claim is narrow only to the extent that Nola Spice copied Hadel's original expression by at least adding a necklace made of smaller beads to what, what would otherwise look like a dog trinket made of much larger beads. Has Nola Spice infringed Hadel's copyrighted expression? We must therefore decide whether the collar on the Nola Spice's bead dogs could suffice to support a finding of substantial similarity in the mind of a reasonable juror. You see how narrow this gets? They they couldn't get it on this, so they couldn't get it on that, and they couldn't. It wasn't the nose, it wasn't the tail, it wasn't the eyes. And so okay, we got the collar left is all we're going to be able to go after. And and isn't that what happened with the Katy Perry thing? There was that one segment, the descending minor ostinato, and it's not. Let's be clear here again. This is not just the notes that were in the descending minor auto. That is not what's protectable. That is the idea. It is the expression in a tangible medium, in this case a recording, so we're not really questioning that it's, that it's recorded. Uh, it is the expression that is protectable. So it is the, the tone, the portamento, the 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 voice or the or the the sample that was used it's how it was used which which octave range was it used in and would this ordinary reasonable layperson observer hear those two things and go oh yeah that's substantially similar uh, it doesn't have to be strikingly similar so we're not looking for that kind of reaction that's an actual legal standard striking similarity it has to be less than a striking similarity but more than just similarity it has to be substantial similarity, something more than just similar, something about the core or the heart or the meaning has to be similar. Because the idea of a collar is unprotectable, only the expression as a string of spheres is relevant to the analysis of substantial similarity. As a threshold matter, we question whether using bead-shaped spheres for a bead dog's collar is sufficiently original to merit copyright protection at all. Even if a bead-shaped collar possesses the requisite creative spark, its minimum originality counsels against a finding of substantial similarity. In light of these considerations, no reasonable jury could find substantial similarity based solely on Hadel's expression of the collar. So now think of the Katy Perry joyful noise thing. I think we can get away with at least playing the very beginning of each here. So we'll take our chances with copyright infringement and copyright strikes on YouTube here.
You know what it is. All right, so that's the joyful noise sample. Let's do dark horse. It's a little it's a little bit different. Is it substantially different so so much so that it undoes the jury's finding of substantial similarity? And no. Um, I've listened to these about half a dozen times each so far, and probably will a, a little bit more because we've got to edit this, remember. Um, and and yeah, I hear it. Could an ordinary an ordinary lay person find that those two segments or descending minor ostinatos are substantially similar? And yes, they could. And then when you listen to the songs overall, there's really nothing else to differentiate the songs. Not, not that you can undo copyright infringement by making the rest of the song different, but uh, they're, they're, they're different songs, but they're not so different that it makes me think like Bach versus hip hop. You know, they're, they're both kind of trappy, rappy songs. Katy Perry's tone is different. The music video is silly. Uh, I, you know, they obviously had fun with it, uh, but that doesn't change the copyright infringement inquiry. It's okay, you had fun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, we often see that in copyright infringement cases. We see where someone says, you copied my facts and therefore you're guilt guilty of copyright infringement because I invested a lot of time and money in obtaining those facts. I flew to a little-known tribe in South America and, and interviewed them, and to my surprise, they spoke English and understood climate change, and they said that their temperatures had risen three degrees in the past, whatever. And so ABC News comes and says, ancient tribe in village in South America reports three degrees climate change rise. Is that copyright infringement? No! But you spent millions of dollars getting that information from that person. Or you spent millions of dollars researching a scientific fact and discovering a scientific fact. And then ABC News comes along and says, a scientist discovers that if you simply add ice to water, you get colder water. That's not a copyrightable thing. That's, that's not copyright. But it's just the descending minor ostinato. We can never write a descending minor ostinato into a song again. I understand you, I hear you, I feel you. As a musician who has played the piano for 20, no, 32 years, wow, actually it's more than that, I think it's 34 years, I'm, I'm old, um, who's played the piano for a long time, not necessarily a, you know, sustaining professional musician or anything like that, although I've had my gig or two. I understand that this is difficult, this is tough, and this is frustrating, but the st at least I can assure you that the standard isn't that any descending minor ostinato is going to get this kind of treatment. No, it has to be substantially similar and it has to be something the jury would find it to be substantially similar. Is that an easier standard? No, that's still a very hard standard to sort of understand as you're trying to do the creative process of writing music. You're, you're not going to really be in the back of your mind. Okay, now did, did, did Katy Perry use this? Did Flame use this? Is this sound? You shouldn't create that way, but you should be aware of it before you publish. And if you find something substantially similar, well, you have to change it enough. Maybe it's just the timbre, maybe it's just, it's not gonna, it's not gonna be that you have to change the notes just because Flame had a descending minor astonato. Well, you might have to change the notes if no matter what you do, it still sounds substantially similar. But we can't generalize and just say you have to change the sample or you have to change the pattern or you have to change the notes or you have to change the timing. No, 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 you have to make it not substantially similar to a jury whom you don't know in the future. So yeah, I get it's tough. Let's ask questions about this because this is a seriously difficult concept and uh, it, it's, uh, it's not that I will be able to answer all your questions. I think it's good to have them asked and interacted with. And if there's questions that I can't answer, I might choose to bring those to my colleagues and see if, if we can get an answer. Yeah, I also wanna quickly highlight Kotaku 
who asked did the case find whether or not the producers or whoever were aware of the flame song and i think it did came out they did have potential access yeah, to it yeah so this is this is another this is an unfair part it's a little bit unfair but i also thought about this and it's not that unfair in my humble opinion Part of the copyright inquiry here, because we've been just talking about substantial similarity, but you don't get copyright infringement by just having substantial similarity. Two artists can come to create the same work, totally substantially similar, could be identical, as long as they didn't have access to each other's works. So it's not just ownership of valid copyright plus substantial similarity between the works. It's ownership of valid copyright plus access plus substantial similarity. And we don't we, we skipped over that other stuff because it's pretty the, the the first part ownership of a copyright was not disputed. And then we were really disputing these the substantial similarity part. But in there was a whole segment of the trial about whether Katy Perry's writing team had access to Flame's song. Now, Flame's song on YouTube only has 150,000 views, but it's my understanding that they that they are a fairly popular band in Christian rap, and you're you're not talking about random non-musicians off the street who just one day decide to write a Katy Perry song and have never heard music before. Like, let's be clear here. These are super professional, high-end musicians who know how to write music together, are probably represented but in some way by a union or a writer's guild or something like that. They listen to music all the time because they are scholars in music and music writing. So is it really that unfair to assume without without even getting to the part of the testimony whether they actually had access or not but just to assume that flame song was popular and that music scholars would have been at least aware of a popular song yeah i think it's fair to assume that music scholars because remember katy perry's writing team is not writing in a vacuum and they have heard music before and they do actively listen to music so I'm 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 pretty okay with the access question. If someone accused me of copyright infringement, yeah, maybe I could make a better argument because I don't I'm not a music scholar of, of that sort and I don't write music professionally and listen to music professionally, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Although that sounds like a cool career. Maybe I should do that next. What do you think? Should I be a rock star for my next career? I'll be I'll be that lawyer. I'll be a lawyer who does parodies and raps them. How about that? You want to see? You want to see this? 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 You want to see me rap some things? Mm, I'm not really into rap, so. Okay. Well, I, mean, well, I think I did. I promised a hundred thousand subscriber rap, and that was. We're coming up on a year, so I, I really should have. I should really cash in on that promise. <laughs> that is our show, everyone. Thank you for joining me. I am Leonard French, your favorite copyright attorney, and in the studio with me here has been Kaylee, and in the virtual studio. Brandon, our community manager as well. Thank you very much to our patreon.com slash ljfrench and sponsus.org slash law supporters. This channel is only possible because of your financial support. And YouTube, of course, regularly demonetizes our videos, so we really need that support. Thank you very much to our $500 plus supporter for the month of August. This is Joshua Davis's second month supporting. He is he has asked us to make a video about his Tanda Pay service, and that we're working on that, and that should be out very shortly here. And thank you to our $50 plus supporters: John Steele, Gavin Barnard, Evie, Kyle Mudrock, Michael Pierce, Jan de Grey, Blackleaf, Spirit Bear, Daniel Perez, Snorri Wazatsky, Not Mike, Joe Tyson, and King Macro. Very nice to see some new names up there. Uh, thank you very much to all of our $50 plus supporters. And thank you very much to the $5 plus supporters who are scrolling on the LED panel behind me. And all of these people will be in the description below. Anyone who supports at $5 or above gets put into the description and the crawl and the panel. Um, it only costs a dollar to support us if you would like a little bit of behind the scenes access. We're working on giving you more behind the scenes access. So, uh, you know, we thank you for your support. Uh, I'm Leonard French, your favorite copyright attorney. I will play some dog video in the edited videos that drop, and we'll see you then. Love you all. Have a good week. Bye.